Good. Well, a warm welcome to this video. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome Senator Rennick from the Australian Senate. Senator, thank you so much for making the time to come on to the, to the video. Uh, thanks for having me on today, John. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And can I just congratulate you on all the excellent work that you've done over the last 18 months? Uh, in you know raising concerns about the vaccine and the various you know risk reward potential uh, involved with the vaccine, and and indeed I've been following the work that you've been doing, and it really is quite uh, quite brave to say the least. The work that you've been doing. Now we want to discuss this document here. Uh, this is from the TGA, the Therapeutics uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration Administration in Australia, which authorises therapeutics. It's called a non-clinical evaluation report and it's in the on the Pfizer vaccine and it's dated January 2021. So this is presumably just before the vaccines were approved in Australia from, from my general background. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. Now, um, first, first of all, there's some amazing things that you pointed out in your analysis that I'd like to look at. Um, really quite startling, actually. I mean, if... Um, do make the time to watch this video, everyone, because it, there is some really amazing stuff in here that, that Senator Rennick has highlighted from this report. Um, how come this report is in the public domain, first of all, Senator? Please? Well, that's thanks to the work of a, a lady in Melbourne, actually, who put in a freedom of information request uh, and clearly must have known what she was talking about that actually asked for the actual non-clinical evaluation report. And so it was finally released after months of hassling and uh, and. They wanted to charge thousands originally to get this data released and this particular lady was like a bulldog uh, and just fought the TGA to get the data released. So it was finally released the first draft on the 15th of July 2021 uh, with a number of other yep. documents and it's known as the 2389 series uh, and if you get on the you know, Google TGA FOI uh, log, uh, you will see it if you scroll back down to the 15th of July and this particular document we're looking at today is 2389 dash six. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and we will put a link, you can download this full document. It runs to 58 pages. Yeah, and, and there is a bit of an addendum to that, is that the lady who initially lodged the FOI, there was a large part of that document was initially redacted and she kept fighting mm -hmm. them and she's finally got uh, more of it unredacted in December 2022, 18 months later. Uh, and there's some very interesting data in there that was re actually redacted the first time, which I think uh, was negligent of the TGA not to actually release so that people could make a fully formed choice as to what they were taking. Mm -hmm. So I think it's clear to emphasize that the, uh, the Therapeutics Goods Administration in Australia had all this information prior to authorizing the vaccines, the, the COVID vaccines, that this was known about. Um, now, the, the first point, you've made, raised quite a few points. Um, do, should we, can we go through these? Yeah, the absolutely. Point you've raised from page, the point you've raised from page four. Um, almost similar microscopic lung inflammation was observed in both challenged control and immunized animals. So we're, we're saying, what I was saying here, can you, do you want to unpack that a little bit? Well, first? my understanding of that when I read it was, was that there didn't seem to be a lot of benefit um, uh, from the vaccine uh, in the immunised rats, uh, and if, as you know, yep. if, and I'm happy to be corrected on this. I'm not an expert, mm. but it would appear to me that there wasn't a great deal of benefit from getting the vaccine in the first place. If I if I read that correctly, I think you did, and this is this is in in, in monkeys, so it's a fairly fairly close human analogue, and uh, it, it seems to be showing that the vaccines didn't show clinical improvement in animal studies. So why we would assume that there would be this improvement in humans is is somewhat unclear. And and the other thing here is that, that they didn't compare the uh, antibody response between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, which does seem like a bit of a an omission. So, um, in, but in terms specifically of the lung damage, there didn't seem to be a great deal of difference between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Um, the, 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 the other point you made is, is page four, um, about the distribution. Uh, there's no distribution and degradation data on, on the S antigen encoding. What, what was the, the concern there, Senator? Well, well, I mean, this is obviously the first time that we've got a, a vaccine that uses mRNA to create a protein. Uh, I, I would have thought it would have been more than obvious uh, to actually test the output 
of the vaccine. And in those animal trials, they, they used luciferase, which is a benign enzyme. Uh, but, you know, as someone once described to me, that's like crossing a border, you know, a truck crossing a border with fruit versus a truck crossing a border with explosives. Um, mm. You know, it, it's the content inside, uh, you know, the mRNA. Well, well, you know, it's what that mRNA encodes for. So obviously the question, they needed to test all the potential risks of that protein. And that can be, did it actually get secreted from the cell or did it stay in the cell membrane? Uh, did the actual S protein travel um, through throughout the body organs, and we'll get onto that later, without the lipid degrading in the first place before it even entered the cell, so that you've got mRNA actually inside the circulatory system before it even hits the cell. So that can be a problem in itself or a potential problem. Uh, and then once, if, if then you've got the issue of, okay, well, let's just say it stayed on the membrane and induced an autoimmune response. How severe was that autoimmune response? Did it destroy the entire cell uh, or did it just destroy the bit on the um, cell membrane? And then if it did get secreted from the cell, how far did that spike protein travel? How long did it stay in the body for? Uh, did it cause clotting? So these are all the questions that, you know, we're putting this out across billions of people uh, that, you know, people have a right to know what the impact of the so-called translation of the mRNA into the protein and the impacts mm -hmm. of that on their body would have been. And we, we do know that the, 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 the data shows here, I've got this page here, that the, the, the systemic distribution is, is quite stunning. We were initially told that this just stays in the deltoid muscle. A bit, but, but here, here we see that the, the vaccine's actually been found in adipose tissue, adrenal glands, bladder, bone, bone marrow, brain, eyes, heart, injection site, kidneys, large intestine, liver, lungs, basically all over the body. So th th they knew about this systemic distribution that that was there and, and that was known about. And and the other th the other thing we were told that the um, the vaccine would only the mRNA would only stay there for a short period of time. But then we read from page four that there is actually no degradation data. That's exactly we're right. Not told, we're not told how quickly it would it would go away. Really quite incredible. Yeah, so, so um, t two big issues there. So some of the pushback I've had from the TGA in regards to that distribution is they're saying it's at levels that's not toxic to the body in the other cells, yeah. in the other body organs. Now, that may be true after two days, but the question is why did they stop it after two days when the level of concentration in those organs was still increasing. I would have thought you would run the trial long enough so that the actual lipids and the mRNA and the spike protein was actually le had left the body. So the question is, mm -hmm. you know, how long did the, those other body organs continue to increase uh, in the lipids that then translate into the protein? And then like you say, mm -hmm. how long did it take you know, for the lipids uh, any, you know, mRNA that didn't convert into proteins and the proteins themselves, how long did it actually take for that to degrade and, and leave the body? That's the, one of the things I found most concerning, really, that we weren't, we were told that the, the mRNA would break down in a short period of time, but here it's saying that that simply was not studied. Um, so we, at the time this vaccine was approved, people simply didn't know how long it would last for. Um, another point I, I got from page five was that the, the antibody and T-cell response that was present initially declined quite rapidly over five weeks. So it looks like the TGA knew that this would only last for a short period of time. Is that Was that your reading? Yeah, yeah that's exactly my reading. And, mm. you know, this is, this is something else that they never made clear is that they waited three weeks to even count you as being vaccinated after you were vaccinated. So for the first three weeks, you're counted as unvaccinated. Uh, so that leaves about two weeks of protection uh, before, you know, it, its effectiveness, if you if you want to you know, say it was effective, uh, starts to wane anyway. So yet, mm -hmm. yet again, we go back to that, you know, initial data where there was very little difference in microscopic lung information mm -hmm. after day eight, day nine, versus such a short-term duration. And... And, and this is the thing, if you've got to take multiple shots of uh, a vaccine to get protection, then you start bringing in mm. other issues like, you know, uh, immune imprinting, uh, any impacts on your immune system if you're constantly repeated, giving it repeated exposure to antibodies. Uh, sorry, you know, to, to mm. the vaccine. To the, to the vaccine, yeah. 
Um, and another thing I noted from page six, long term immunity, uh, um, va vaccine induced autoimmune disease w were not studied. So we've got this risk. Well, it's not a risk. We, we now know that the, 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 the TGA knew in January 2021 that there was systemic distribution of, of this vaccine. And yet it specifically says on page six, long term immunity autoimmune diseases were not studied. I mean, how do we account for the fact that these things weren't studied? It just seems rather, ra rather strange. How could there be so many omissions? Well, well, yet again, and I mean, this, this you didn't need to read the TGA report to know this. It, it was also in the Pfizer documents, the original Pfizer documents, where they note that they didn't do long-term studies and, and you, know, you know, toxicity studies, carcinogenic studies, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, they, they will argue that, you know, because, you know, COVID was such a severe virus, they needed to roll it out quickly. Now, you know, that may have been a fair point, depending on your point of view, but, you know, it, it, two wrongs don't make a right and taking shortcuts mm -hmm. and particularly my issue was so my particular circumstances were I, I i knew a little bit about biochemistry i'd studied science for a year in my early 30s and had biotech stocks and i've actually had a mrna stock uh in australia um that eventually got taken over by merck roach but so i had a little bit of a background but i knew enough to know that um repeated exp yeah because the coronavirus mutates very quickly yeah, it, it, at best, the vaccine might last one season before you end up with another strain mm. of the flu. So, um, uh, you know, it was never going to provide really long protection, not necessarily because the vaccine was bad, but because the virus would mutate. Uh, so uh, the argument that, you know, you can justify rolling out a vaccine so quickly, I always felt was a bit risky for something that, you know, we, we were eventually going to have to learn to live with. Um, but what we've now got, of course, is, is you know, a lot of vaccine injuries. But... My, my so for the first you know from January 2021 when we'll say let's say November um, 2020 when ju just after Joe Biden got elected and of course there are a few issues there just after Joe Biden was elected we had three companies that uh, pharmaceutical companies come out and say they had a vaccine for coronavirus uh, when in vaccine hadn't been created for the coronavirus in the last 40 years and suddenly within a matter of weeks three companies had found a vaccine that works um, seemed quite astounding if you ask me. Uh, but anyway, you know, I kept my mouth shut, um, knowing that, you know, we needed to do something. Uh, but then around October 2021, I started getting contacted by a lot of young people who were getting severely injured by the vaccine or, you know, were getting injured in a matter of days after taking the vaccine. So there was a very strong temporal association between injuries and people taking the vaccine. Now, that, of course, is the red flag of all red flags, especially for young, fit, healthy people who had no prior um, symptoms suddenly getting ill and what's particularly annoying is is that the authorities have, have seemed to gaslight these injuries and haven't tied back the wide range of injuries back to you know as we looked at page 45 of that document the large number of you know the, the fact that this vaccine does go into a large number of organs which in theory at least you know could be could explain the large number of injuries and the wider range of injuries you know the different symptoms you know yeah, resulting in myocarditis, neurological issues, skin disorders, you know, people having issues with their eyes, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing I, I did notice, page 12 to 14 of the document, it actually runs through specifically things that weren't done, which are really quite inexplicable. For example, there was no toxicity studies on the lipid nanoparticle formulation that was used. Uh, there was no secondary species toxicology. There was no genotoxicity on the on the DNA. There was no uh, cardiogenicity studies to, to find if there was any cancer causing. There was no studies on reproductive activities. Uh, there was no studies on immunotoxicology. There was no juvenile pediatric studies. And uh, it also included uh, novel excipients, which are additional components in the vaccine as well it actually specifically says that these things weren't done when we were absolutely promised by all our chief medical officers at least in the uk and all everyone in the uk that every step that was normally taken in a new vaccine was taken with this it was just compressed but now we've got a big list of things at least in australia that was that were simply not done do you imagine that these emissions were potentially the same in other countries do you think this oh, document is somehow unique to Australia? Absolutely, absolutely not. I mean, you know, we, we purchased this uh, vaccine from Pfizer and it was it was actually manufactured overseas. 
Um, so the only difference would be that in Australia it might take longer to get here and, you know, you have to store it negative 70 degrees, this particular vaccine, so it's a very fragile vaccine. But the, another key point to make here is that everyone, uh, including the health experts, including politicians, were saying this vaccine was safe and effective. Now, they hadn't done enough trials to say that. Now, I've had, you know, and I just note that you put up a prior video of mine in the past, and thank you for that. I've had Indeed, that, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I've had that video pulled down because it was deemed by social media when I posted it to be dangerous. And they're trying to pull another post of mine down when I said the vaccine was dangerous. And I said, well, actually, what's dangerous? I'm, you know, I'm currently threatening to take Facebook to court. Uh, is What's dangerous is when you say a vaccine is safe and effective and you don't have outline all of the risks involved with that vaccine um, and all of the lack of safety testing that you didn't do with it. So, um, yeah, that to me is, is a massive issue. And this, this, and, and the key point about this vaccine is this wasn't a protein vaccine. You might have given it, you know, given the urgency of COVID, you might have given it a, a bit of a pass knowing that, you know, well, we've got a good long history of protein vaccines. This is an mRNA yeah. vaccine. It uses a different pathway. It enters the cell. No other drug has ever done that. I mean, this is a whole new technology. And then they've rolled it out to, you know, a large percentage of the human population, um, assuming that everyone's going to react the same. And now I've got a child who's, you know, I have a son who's allergic to penicillin. Penicillin is a high therapeutic index. Most people are fine with it. But there are a small number of people who are allergic to penicillin. We, you know, every person is unique. And we have to listen to their concerns, especially if they've had prior anaphylactic reactions or reactions to other drugs. Um, but yet here in Australia, we've had people who've got injured from the first vaccine uh, because, and they had to take that vaccine because their employer mandated it. They've been injured and then they've got sacked anyway because they didn't take the second vaccine. So they were forced into choosing between their own health and their own survival and keeping their job. Uh, and, you know, th when you read this document and you read the number of checks and balances that were missed, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, in my view, has been a gross violation of human rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another thing that concerns me there, really, uh, as an elected s senator, uh, you're an elected senator in Australia, and yet social media platforms decide that you can be censored when the people of Australia have elected you into your, your democratic position. It just seems a rather, a rather anomalous uh, situation that we find ourselves in, unfortunately. Yeah, we do. And, uh, you know, as the Twitter files have re revealed, you know, the White House leaned very heavily on social media companies not to promote so-called disinformation about the vaccines, and that's certainly not my intent. My intent, and I, I came from mm. a finance background originally, but, you know, in finance and when you're working in billions of dollars in Treasury you've got to actually, you know, minimise your downside risk. The first thing is to always minimise your downside risk. You know, in health, there's an equivalent saying, do no harm. Uh, and, you know, these these rules have come in place over years because, you know, we've got to protect the people. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I just feel as though those guidelines have been completely trashed, uh, you know, in the last few years with this particular rollout of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Another point raised in the document was that the the uh, the vaccine, the mRNA codon, has been optimised to improve uh, antigen expression to make more spike protein, and the lipid nanoparticles will actually go into numerous body cells that the virus itself can't gain access into. So, so in a sense, that the virus has got much uh, a much smaller distribution in terms of the tissues it can infect than the than the vaccine itself has so i hadn't thought of that before it means they could be getting spike protein in any cell in the body potentially whereas the virus would only affect fairly specific cells with the the ace receptor that that's exactly right john and and that, that particular information was on page 18 and page 19 of the document yeah that information was originally redacted and so we've only became right. aware of that last december now that's incredibly mm. important for a number of reasons if the vaccine produces more spike protein than what the the virus would that that goes against everything a vaccine normally did a vaccine is normally attenuated it's meant to be weaker and you get a smaller dose not a stronger dose and the you know because if you're getting a stronger dose that's kind of counterproductive to the whole purpose of the vaccine you're not getting greater protection you're getting greater risk um yeah. and yet again you have to ask yourself well is this 
does this qualify as gain of function research when you're in injecting a vaccine that produces more of the antigen, not less? And then, so that's the, the, the code on optimization. And then you've got yeah. the transfection issue. So this is a process. Normally, a cell membrane requires enzymes and, and ion channels. So your cell membrane is set up. So, you know, your, your body's made up of about 30 trillion cells. And each little cell is like a little country. You have a cell membrane, which is like a border and a border crossing. Yep. You'll have ribosomes, which are like your factories. They produce proteins. You have your mitochondria, which is like your power stations that provide oxygen and give you energy. You have your nucleus, which is like your little home, and it, that reproduces cells to create more cells. So your cell membrane, it'll have things like ion channels and receptors. And those, those receptors, depending on the organ, will let in certain types of molecules and not others. So... With the and one of the so what the coronavirus did was use the ACE2 receptor as well as the transmembrane serine proteins yeah. um, enzyme to help get the virus across the membrane. What the vaccine did was bypass all of that and use transfection where they've slightly ionized one of the four lipids in the lena, in the lipid nanoparticle uh, to cross any cell membrane. Now that made it much more infectious. So we've now got a, a, a a vaccine that produces more uh, proteins, antigens. We, it's more infectious because it can enter more cells, including cells that are involved with the immune system, the bone marrow, the lymph nodes, um, the spleen. And the question you have to ask yourself is, well, if, if we go back to that initial uh, top of page eight, where you're either going to induce an autoimmune response mm. or export start exporting spike proteins from out of your immune-driven um, organs, does that then um, impede the ability of the immune system to actually uh, do its job and, and, and then go and uh, destroy the virus or the antigens when you actually get coronavirus because it's still fighting the impacts of the vaccine? Um, so, and there's another thing that this, this document doesn't cover. The mRNA has a poly tail, normally, sorry, a poly A tail, Normally that poly A tail has about 30 adenine nucleotides and that slowly gets eaten away um, over a period of time. And then when that poly A tail is finally degraded, then the mRNA strand breaks down. This particular um, vaccine, they've added about another 70 adenine nucleotides so that your poly, poly A tail is about three times longer. So what that means is, is that the mRNA lasts three times longer uh, or about three times longer, it might be quite like that quite that much but um, it's a longer lasting um, mRNA than what's in the virus so so longer lasting stronger not weaker and more infectious um, than the virus is this you know uh, you know this to me goes against everything that a normal vaccine should be doing and and add to that the viral distribution so your normal coronavirus I think had 29 uh, proteins or molecules uh, uh, sorry yeah protein sorry yeah, about 29,000, yeah. um, uh, you know, little uh, uh, nucleotides, uh, um, sorry. Nucleotides, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And so normally you would pull off the spike protein and be left with 28 uh, proteins left. And that's too big to cross the endothelium to get into your capillaries, your blood capillaries. With this particular vaccine, they take the spike protein, i.e. one protein, it's therefore much smaller. It's easier to cross the endothelium, get into the to the blood capillaries and then distribute throughout the body. So you know, now we've got four things that, that increase the risk factor um, of, the, of the vaccine over the virus, which is biodistribution, infectivity, uh, duration, and, and, and the toxicity in terms of how much spike yeah. protein it produces. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the amount of spike protein produced in you and me might be completely different. So the dose becomes completely unpredictable. That, that's exactly yeah. right, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's if you go back to that 2389 series, it's either dash two or dash three, where they talk about the number of doses in one vial. So one vial of the vaccine had five doses and to administer yeah. it, you need to turn it up, you know, turn it up and down 10 times. You can't shake it too, uh, too vigorously or, or the mRNA will degrade. But this is something that's stored at negative 70 degrees. You can defrost it for a couple of days. But how do you know when you've got five doses of 30 microns that one person, is, all five people that use that particular vial will get 30 microns of the dose? So what happens if one particular person got, say, 90 microns because the person was in a hurry because, as you know, there were lots of people uh, getting the vaccine at one time 
and that person happened to weigh 60 kilograms versus someone that's mm. only got 10 microns and weighed 120 kilograms. So mm. yet again, you know, some people will be getting a lot more mRNA than others. Mm. It beggars belief that given that the, the risks involved with this vaccine, that they didn't have one dose per vial so that you could ensure an even co a distribution of the mRNA or the, or the lipid nanoparticle encased mRNA uh, per person. And another thing that I found quite staggering was that there was two ingredients listed in this document that was not on the uh, the TGA's ingredient database. That, that just seems an inexplicable omission. That's that's right. So there's there's four lipids involved in creating the lipid nanoparticle. Two of those lipids had never been used before. And it's interesting, I asked the head of the TGA in estimates about these lipids and he described these lipids as the same as the lipids you'll eat in a stock steak or sausage uh, at breakfast. Well, that's not, not true at all. Uh, one of the lipids is actually ionised, which creates its own, by definition, that's not really a lipid. Um, sure, phospholipids are ionised, but a lipid, you know, in its pure sense of the word, isn't ionised at all. Um, it's hydrophobic. Um, so... Yet again, you know, we've been, I've been misled by my, the own, our own regulator about the potential risks of those lipids, which in itself is a concern. And of course, the other thing is when they manufactured this vaccine, they changed the manufacturing uh, methodology and how they did it. And I'll have to read it out because it's on page 19. It's a bit over my head as well, but page 19, um, third paragraph, Several manufacturing process changes for the vaccine, including production scale, were introduced during development. Uh, the pr proposed commercial scale manufacturing processes, including the use of linearized plasma DNA template for mRNA production. Whereas in early development phases, PCR amplif amplification of DNA template was used. So that then begs the question that if they've used um, a, D a plasma DNA template, how have they filtered the DNA plasma out of the actual 37 litre batches? So in the uh, um, trial batches were 300 mils, the production batches were 37 litres. So I think that's a, a, a difference of about uh, 100 times um, off the top of my head uh, in, in terms of scale. How have they managed to filtrate those DNA plasmids out of the actual um, concentration and so that it didn't get into the vials and, and that's not being injected into the body as well. Now, they may have been able to do that, I don't know, um, but yet again, another risk uh, that, in my view, hasn't been adequately tested uh, before giving it to billions of people. And indeed, page 19, unfortunately, um, still quite a few black boxes on that page. Yes. Um, yeah. what, what, why, why is this material still being redacted? Why isn't it into the public domain for discussion now? Well, well that's, a, that's an excellent question. I mean, you know, this sort of uh, uh, behaviour by the pharmaceutical companies, myself and uh, yeah. a couple of other senators down here in Australia, we've tried to get the actual Pfizer contract uh, and the mm. government says it's commercial incompetence. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, if they wanted to keep the amount they paid for the vaccine, commercial incompetence. I mean, I'd argue that's not okay either. But when you're talking about something that we are expected to take the government's word on that it's safe and effective, surely we should have access to all the medical data and biochemical chem data involved in, in, the, in the vaccine. And we've been denied that, right? And, you know, for example, you know, what I've just read out to you was originally redacted. Well, yet again, mm. why was stuff critical, information critical uh, to the production of this vaccine withheld from the public? I mean, the whole point of science is that you publish material and open it to peer review. Absolutely. Science has to be contestable. Uh, yeah. And not, not only was this document, well, it was attempted to be, to, to be hidden from the public. It was only this tenacious lady with the freedom of information the request that got us this document. That, that's and, right. And, uh, and even now, that it's still partly redacted. Why, why, why can't the world scientists, statisticians and data scientists, of which we have plenty, read this and 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 and, and, and peer review it for us it just seems it just seems unnecessarily cryptic for, for some reason it does indeed and you know it's given the large number of vaccine injuries and, and the rise in excess deaths across the world i think people are entitled to know uh 
and, and have answers from both our health regulators and, and Big Pharma uh, as to the risks of this vaccine and why they didn't uh, warn people about this early on. Yeah. So the the Australian authorities authorised the vaccine based on, on, on this document. So th this document is primarily written by the, the TGA and shared with Pfizer. Is that is that the, the thing? This is like a clarification of the TGA's thinking at the time. Yeah, so, so this is basically the TGA's uh, regulated, reg, uh, you know, regulation document to say, yeah. well, this is how we've examined what Pfizer have given to us. It's worth yeah. noting that, you know, the TGA never examined the, 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 the patient data uh, of the actual Pfizer trial. They never went and, and you know, drilled down on some granular data and, 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 and actually did an audit of the Pfizer trial results, and I'm sure you've covered that in the past. Um, but, you know, so they, for example, of you know, when Pfizer, for example, described Matty DeGarry as just having stomach issues, the TGA never went and drilled down on those issues to find out, no, actually, she's in a wheelchair and being fed through a tube. Um, they've just taken a lot of that Pfizer data at face value. And then, uh, that, so, and that, that of course, is, uh, this is non-clinical data, uh, and that, of course, would be clinical data, um, but, um uh yeah i mean it, it's this is their way of saying well we've rubber stamped what pfizer have given us more or less yeah. but interestingly yeah. enough they rubber stamped it after highlighting a number of risks and i i, I don't yeah. know if they thought they never had to release this document and that it was never going to be open to scrutiny and, and i'm very grateful to nancy the lady who actually got this document as well and, and i should i won't list all the doctors that have helped me out with this um you know get, getting information to me but uh without this information being released, we would have not had any idea just how poor the, the auditing and quality assurance on, on the production and rollout of the vaccine has been. Yeah, we expect these national uh, adjudication authorities to, to really go the extra mile to look after your safety and my safety and our kids' safety. And, and it, it appears that in the TGA example that we have in front of us here, that, 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 that wasn't done. And... Uh, Personally, I have no reason to suspect that other countries are, are, are any are any uh, better than the Australian authorities, which are normally very, very rigorous indeed. Yeah, and, and I should uh, point out, John, it's it's not um, it's not uh, the extra mile. It's actually their job. Yeah, yeah. you know, it, it, yeah. it's it's yeah. um, and, and they fail to yeah. do their job. And of course, you know, when I'm, you know, yeah, as we know, um, uh, it, it's. Here in Australia, ninety-six percent of the TGA's funding actually comes from big pharma fees. So they, there is a massive conflict of interest, and the question really needs to be asked: Is should these regulatory bodies be funded by big pharma and what they call a, you know, cost recoup recouping costs, or should, yeah. you know, we really need to split between we need a department that approves the drugs, but then we need a separate, you know, entirely arm's length apart. Another, another department yeah. that reviews the people that, that actually review the drugs mm -hmm. and regulate the mm -hmm. drugs because there is a massive conflict of interest. And I know John Skerritt is on the, on the board of a couple of, a couple of uh, international committees that are funded by Big Pharma. So he's got another conflict of interest there. So John Skerritt, for the listeners who aren't aware, is the head of the TGA, was the head of the TGA uh, in, Australia. Uh, in Australia. He's just recently resigned. Um, but, you know, Massive conflicts of interest themselves are red flags. You know, when you try and hold uh, the bureaucrats and the government of the day to account, they just, you know, brush you aside as if to say it doesn't matter. And, and the really sad thing about this is that there's, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people out there across the world who have been badly let down by their governments, uh, first of all, by not properly reviewing the risks of this vaccine and, number one, number two, in many cases, mandating that they had to get this vaccine, and then number three, those people who did get vaccinated uh, have, and who have been injured and are struggling now to get compensation, uh, both financial and proper medical support. Mm. The thing I've never really understood about the vaccination program, especially looking back, and I think I think my disquiet grew at about the same time as yours, um, October 2021, uh, things were becoming... Yeah. Pretty, uncom pretty uncomfortable at that, at that time. Before that, we were basically taking their word for it because, but if they'd released this document in 2021, then we would have been in a much better position. The question in my mind is, why did 
the go for mRNA vaccines and indeed adenovirus vector vaccines with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine as opposed to a tried and trusted technology, given that we had a vaccine rollout that was going to, at the time it was planned to go to about 7 billion people, why on earth would they not use something tried and tested? Why on earth would they use something novel? That is a very good question. And I know that this has been stated on your show before with Robert Clancy. He has said that, you know, there's this myth that it takes a lot longer to produce a protein vaccine. And, you know, is he right? Well, you know, he, no, right? I mean, he's one of Australia's uh, animate... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, vaccinologists, uh, you know, they, they have produced protein uh, vaccines in a matter of months in the past. It wasn't as though they needed to go there. Um, and, and, you know, yet again, another question, why did they take on a novel technology that hadn't mm. been adequately tested um, over the tried and true methods of, uh, you know, a protein vaccine? And, you know, we come back to this, you know, and, and look, you know, I'm sure the you know, virus existed. I'm not saying the virus didn't exist and it wasn't a risk to older people. But when you look at the yeah, healthy well, sure. working age population, they mm. had a much lower risk of the of the virus. And, you know, they may still have got crook, don't get me wrong. Um, yeah. But did we need to, you know, when we weigh up, weigh up the, the, the costs and the benefits um, or the risk and reward, was it really worth risking the health of younger people in particular uh, to take this vaccine when their risk from the virus is very low. And I should just add this week, ATAGI, uh, which is sort of another regulatory body, has actually admitted that for people under 30, the risk of the vaccine in regards to myocarditis is actually greater um, from the vaccine than what it was from the virus. So that they've actually got themselves in a big trouble now because they mm -hmm. haven't, you know, they've been saying the opposite thing for the last two years. And there's young children, I know, I've spoken to many of them, Faith Ransom being one of them, uh, who've had their lives destroyed uh, by, by vaccine. I mean, you know, they, they can't go to school. Young Faith, she, she was a beautiful 16-year-old girl, uh, and she can't go to school now. Um, she, she started back at school this year after having a year off, and she struggles to get through more than a couple of hours. Um, and there really needs to be answers. You know, and, and, you know, these people need to explain why they, they've destroyed so many lives. Which group was it that said that the, the, the risk for the under 30s is no longer acceptable? So it's a TAGI. So the TGA are regulates a and then a TAGI. Yeah. And I, I can't think of the, oh, right. the acronym, what the acronym stands. The, the, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll find sorry. it. I'll put the link um, in, yeah. It's no, 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 that, that's Technical fine. Advisory yeah. Group for Immunisation. I think that's what it stands for. Um, and this is another thing, right? I mean, I, you know, I mean, you don't, there's so many bureaucracies uh, in Australia mm. that, you know, it, it takes oh, just everywhere. three years to work out all these different organisations <laughs> yeah, that you've never yeah. heard of, uh, yeah, all on the tax, right. living, living uh, quite well off that's the taxpayer right. dollar. Um, so, yeah. and then that's yeah, the other great indeed. deflection when you start trying to pinpoint who's responsible for this regulation, they keep pointing yeah. at the other agencies. So you yeah. often get sent going yeah. around on a circular loop. Uh, yeah. you know, because they keep blaming other agencies. When the Omicron virus became predominant, and that was for most of Australia's uh, outbreak, actually, most of Australia's pandemic was Omicron. Did, did the government and the regulatory authorities realise Omicron was much less pathogenic than the previous variants and change their vaccination recommendations? Or did they just plough on as they were before? They didn't just plough on, they doubled down. So yeah. about the same time, and I think it was Kyle, the, uh, the mountain biker, late October. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So that was when I started getting, literally the same week, I started getting injuries from young people as well. And that was a very, very important video you released that. Uh, John, you should be very proud of what you did there. Well, um, Kyle should be very proud at sharing yeah, his suffering with the world. Absolutely, and it? the vilification yeah. he's caught for just coming out. And, and yeah. you know, I mean, he was injured. You know, he, he was a victim oh. and he just, yeah. you know, was just treated terribly. Like, and subsequently... Mm -hmm. You know, as it turns out, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of others, have been treated the same yeah. way. Um, You're a mad young man. Go away. It's in your mind. Yeah. Um, but Terrible. But our guys here in Australia doubled down. So we were supposed to open up uh, at 80% vaccination rate across the country. But instead, what our state premiers did was they doubled down and told everyone to get a booster. This is when Omnicron was breaking out. So, you know, at the same time they were saying it wasn't as bad, they were telling everyone yeah. to get a booster. Children had to get vaccinated as well as teenagers. Yeah. And I mean, I heard yeah. from teenagers who couldn't go to school formals because they weren't vaccinated. You know, that, you know, students, university students, two or three years through their degree, they can't complete it because they're not vaccinated. I mean, this is just absurd, right? Um, and you were totally. basically locked out of society 
uh, if you didn't get your first two jabs for a vaccine, which was prepared for the alpha variant. And by this stage, we've gone through alpha, delta and omicron. So the vaccine itself was out of date. And as you we pointed out. Or even earlier, it was more for the Wuhan variant. Yeah, exactly. The original one. And, and as yeah. you know, this document shows that antibody started to drop off after 30, 35 days anyway. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. That, I mean, I was surprised. I was surprised by. I was really surprised and, by that. And that was a stronger dose, remember? Because those uh, Wistar rats and uh, sorry, the the, the uh, monkeys. Uh, what were yeah. they? I can't remember the type of monkeys they were, but they only weigh. Uh, McKeats. Mc- yeah, yeah, yeah. McKeats. They only weigh ten kilograms, and they were getting three mm-hmm. times the dose. So you know, right. a, a, a weight to dose ratio twenty times stronger than a human, and the antibodies are dropping mm-hmm. off after thirty five days. So how many days mm-hmm. did that last in a seventy kilogram human? Maybe two to three. Yeah. Who knows, right? We don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. We, we simply don't know. We, we haven't been told. If the work's been done, we haven't. It's not. We've not been told. So, the, the Australian government's made a deal recently with uh, Moderna, uh, as has the UK government, as has the Canadian government, and you're building a plant. Uh, I think it might be Brisbane area. I'm not sure to, to, to produce a hundred million doses of mRNA vaccines a year in Australia. Um, do you have any concerns about that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, because the fact that they've come out and made this commitment, it's actually in Melbourne they're going to do it. Uh, Melbourne, they've, yeah. they've made this commitment uh, and, and they're, you know, it, it's the gov- because the government's involved with this and they're, they're spruiking it as an announcement, it's, a, it's become political and health shouldn't be political. So the question no. is, and if you've got, and we know that, you know, the big pharmaceutical companies have a lot of influence over governments because of the conflict of interest with the TGA, that hasn't been resolved and it needs to be resolved. But if, if the government is dropping $2 billion on helping Moderna build this plant in Melbourne, they're going to have to justify uh, why they're spending this money. So, you know, it, it creates an incentive to report on every new virus as though it's a threat to mankind um, or, you know, or, or at least overemphasise the risk of it. There's definitely incentive there because the people who you know, the so-called health experts are the people who rely on the existence of these viruses to justify their own careers, right? So it becomes, you know, Mm -hmm. self-feeding. And, you know, the reality is that we have lived with viruses for, you know, thousands of years. Um, Always, always. Always. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. um, and look, don't get me wrong, especially with bacterial, and and I think it's important that people know there's different levels, you know, different types of pathogens. So you have a bacterial type of pathogen, you know, double-stranded DNA type of pathogen, hence your smallpox. That was originally the Edward Jenner, um, you know, uh, virus that uh, Edward Jenner mm. found the first cure type of vaccine for. Um, mm. And then you have this single-stranded mRNA vaccine, uh, sorry, mRNA virus, virus. Um, yeah. which potentially mutates much faster and coronaviruses oh, are known mm. to mutate very fast. So the idea that we're going to continually try and vaccinate against fast, rapidly mutating viruses uh, it is is a ridiculous thing, and especially in light of the fact that we know about immune imprinting and that repeated vaccination. Just like we all know that you know we shouldn't overuse antibiotics. Well, it's the same principle when it comes to vaccines. You shouldn't overuse vaccines because you will downregulate. Robert Clancy's touched on this many times with you that you will eventually bring in your downregulating antibodies, um, which can have catastrophic effects on the body. Mm-hmm. And does it concern you that there's plans to produce other vaccines in the mRNA format as well? For example, influenza, that there's plans to make the influenza vaccine an mRNA vaccine. I mean, do you think that could give the same autoimmune problems as the COVID mRNA vaccine? Potentially. I mean, obviously, it'll depend on the quality of the vaccine. I mean, you know, I do think we should judge every vaccine on its own merits. Yeah. Uh, but given that what we've seen from the mRNA vaccine with coronavirus, the fact of the matter is is that, yeah, as we highlighted those risks before, there are a lot more risks involved with using an mRNA vaccine than there is with a protein vaccine. Uh, and, and of course, the other thing is we haven't touched on, which I know you touched on before with um, Robert, is the fact that, you know, a, a flu vaccine, is, it's a respiratory mucosal, um, yep. uh, not vaccine, sorry, a, a respiratory virus, is it, it yep. comes in through the mucosal system. So, mm-hmm. you know, are we better off looking at nasal sprays that kill the virus in the mucosal system uh, rather than injecting an mRNA vaccine into your, you know, into your blood, yeah. bloodstream um, that won't have the same impact as something that, you know, can get to your mucosal system? And yet again, are we better off rather than trying to, uh, you know, 
treat the entire population? Should we look at early treatments, uh, you know, whether it's other types of whatever that drug may be that will actually deal with people when they get sick and that, you know, the 1% of people that get sick rather than expose 100% of the population to all the risks that come with giving a vaccine and the repeated doses of the vaccine, not to mention the cost. I mean, here in Australia, we spent $8 billion on vaccines. I mean, that would have built a lot of hospitals and employed a lot of nurses and doctors, um, you know. And that, that, that's for a population of what? 25 million people. To, yeah. Yeah. $80 billion for 25 million uh, eight, people. Eight, eight just, billion. Sorry. Yeah. Eight billion. Eight, eight, eight billion. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just a, an unimaginable amount of money, isn't it? It's just quite incredible. Yeah. So in the UK, if, if someone has an adverse reaction to a drug or a vaccine, we fill out something called a yellow card. Uh, in the States, they, I think they have something called VARAS, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. Is there a system in Australia and are you happy with it? Um, look, there is a system. It's called the DAIN database here, the TGA database here in Australia. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to go in about two minutes. I've got the bells. No, no, sure. That's okay, of course, but I'll yeah. finish yeah. off on this. We do. Yeah. It's a voluntary system. Uh, it doesn't force people to report. And a lot of people that I've spoken to who are injured don't even know about it. So, you know, mm. because when they're given the vaccine, they're not told, well, if you get injured, come back, contact us, and we will lodge that yeah. data. But I've got a friend who's a cardiologist, for example, who, who had reported three cases of myocarditis and the Queensland Health Department knocked it back and said these people have to go to see their GP. So there has been, in my view, um, what I would call de- deliberate interference by governments to, to downplay the reporting of serious injuries. So it should be mandatory. But we've got another reporting system, Ausvax, that, that had a much higher rate of, um, and they reported after three days, they sent text, pe- text messages to everyone after three days, and 1% of people had to go to hospital um, or see wow. a doctor after the vet, just after wow. three days. And I've spoken to a lot of people who didn't mm-hmm. see their doctor until well after three days. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is a real concern. Um, and yet again, the, in the my view, there's been deliberate downplaying of the actual vaccine. Um, uh, and the risks by the regulatory authorities that approved it, which in itself I- yeah. is of concern. Um, but yeah, in- indeed. And um, but anyway, look, I better go, John. Thank yeah, th- th- Senator. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the work you're doing. Really appreciate it. Okay, and, and thanks uh, very for, much for, the, for everything for this you've time. done, John. It, you know, yeah, like uh, you've been one of the very few people who actually put all the risks out there on the table, and well done for sticking with it. <laughs> and you, th- thank you, Senator, and thank you for your yeah, time. Yeah, thanks very much. Have a great day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You too. Thanks. Bye.